so okay people i have some awfully important news well it's news it was news for me when i got started because um i thought i wanted to uh, get some information about healthcare innovation in africa but i didn't expect to be mind blown like this because africa is just writing history these days and um the traditional model of healthcare in the west is you fall sick then you go for a doctor you find a doctor a hospital you you try to go to the doctor and then you try to get the doctor find one you know get all the money and whatever so so the healthcare model in the west is built on first falling sick then getting treatment kind of thing but um, and the business models are also uh, you know around that context but Africa is leapfrogging the Western uh, healthcare model, and they're coming up with a totally different uh, idea in healthcare. So I'm going to be sharing three true stories uh, from three different um, countries in Africa. And I don't know if you would like to, I mean, if I, I was totally uh fascinated by what i found out because there are certain commonalities in these stories i mean these are from different countries in the continent but uh the way they are unfolding the stories unfolding uh, has so much similarities using technology using new business model and how uh they're coming up with this brand new way of uh providing healthcare is amazing so Let's go ahead and see these stories. So there's going to be three of them, um, and each is unique, uh, but they are all coming from healthcare. Okay, that's the similarity, that's the commonality in the um, because that's where we need to look at this. I mean, there's innovation everywhere in Africa, but healthcare is serious. So I, uh, by the way, I found many, many stories and it was difficult to pick which one to share with you. Uh, so I had time for only uh, three of them and they are uh, uh, true life stories, real stories uh, of real organizations with real people, real challenges. Uh, so bear with me and see if you like it for yourself. And at the very end, I'm going to share something personal for you that is personal for you to do okay so it's going to have a personal message to each one of you so we're going to start out with dr raj panjabi um, from liberia he um had migrated to liberia with his family when he was a kid but a, a war broke out and they had to flee the country and they went to the us and there he studied and he became a medical doctor when he when the war was over and he came back uh to liberia it was it was a miserable situation and he said there were only 51 doctors in a 4 million population i mean a population of 4 million has only 51 doctors and that is if you're lucky and if you're in the city you get to at least have a chance to get this doctor right but uh in uh, rural areas you know out in the middle of nowhere um if you had a sick child let's say a two-year-old with a malaria case with high fever then uh you might have to get to the other side you have to cross the river with a canoe or something um, and then you might have to walk for two days two days in the jungle to get the kid to uh, a doctor so uh, he said that is just unacceptable uh, all these people and no health care provision over there so but he met with Musu at 18 years old Musu was different from her peers because she was able to graduate from high school and when she came back to her community uh, she had 
she wanted to help to people with malaria, pneumonia, all these uh, people and children. And until 48 years old, when Dr. Raj met Musu, she never had a single paying job. Uh, but she could read, she could write, she was very bright. And um, that's, that's how Dr. Raj thought, maybe we could use people like Musu to uh, get to the last mile help, okay? To get to the out in the middle of nowhere places, these people can help us doctors to get to the patients. So he founded Last Mile Health. Uh, it's an NGO, and he uh, he basically was getting married in uh, 2007, and he didn't have any capital to found, uh, to establish any organization like this. So he asked the wedding. Uh, he asked people who was willing to give wedding gifts. He, he, he said please don't give us any wedding gifts, but just donate whatever you want to give to this bank account. And he collected $6,000. And that's how Last Mile Health was uh, founded. And uh, the idea was to get Musu uh, to train her and uh, to teach her certain skills like diagnosing uh, or screening certain diseases and what to do when or how kind of things and equipping her with certain uh, rapid medical diagnostic uh, devices like small tiny, tiny things, but they work. And also giving her a phone, a smartphone so that she could report to the doctor uh, what's going on with the patient. So she was like a mm, portable medical person. Um, but she was also uh, being trained and coached by a nurse, like on uh, how to measure malnutrition uh, with a kid. So there's this measure measuring tape. So they wrap it around the kid. And if it's in the green zone, the kid is okay. If it's in the yellow zone, that's dangerous. In the red zone, the kid needs to be hospitalized. And um, so she could, you know, diagnose malnutrition, or she could uh, assess the cause of a cough of a child with a smartphone. So when the child is coughing, they can hold the smartphone. And with the app, the smartphone can actually detect the cause of the cough, right? And um, she was following up, um, attending with HIV cases uh, or uh, giving uh, follow-up care to people who lost limbs. So this is Musu learning primary uh, healthcare knowledge and disseminating this knowledge to her community and letting uh, the doctors know about epidemics or urgent cases or whatever. So that's case number one. And then there is AB. This boy is an orphan who had to drop out for middle school and he turned out to be a community health worker at Last, Mil Last Mile Health. <clears throat> uh, he found Prince when Prince was six months old. Prince was seriously uh, underfed or uh, not not nourished at all. So uh, AB had learned how to uh, do the child nutrition tests. Uh, so this prince was had to be. He was in the red zone. He had to be hospitalized. So actually, um, AB took the mom and the kid and paddled for four hours to the hospital, and uh, the kid was attended, and he was saved. When he was discharged from the hospital, uh, AB was able to uh, teach the mom how to supplement, uh, give food supplement in terms of uh, how to give uh, the baby the food supplements that he needs. So when Dr. Raj was visiting with uh, AB uh, last time, Prince was a chubby little guy. He was doing fine and he was holding himself on a stand and was able to say a couple of words. So imagine you're just touching the life of a person. Um, 
so this this is just one of the organizations we're moving on to the second story these are true life stories people in the second story i'm going to introduce dr yetunde from nigeria uh dr yetunde she uh, is a local Nigerian. She married for love and moved to Lagos. And then uh, she had her medicine uh, studies and then went abroad, worked for international companies, organizations. And then she came back and started her consulting business. And when she was working in the city, she realized she had so much spare time because at times she was loaded with patients and then she had no one to care for. And she wondered like, there's all these people that need healthcare. And here I am sitting doing nothing because I can't reach my patients. And how am I supposed to find these patients? Because she was burning with passion when she was a medical student, but when she became a doctor, she was just waiting for patients to come to her, to get to her. And the patients were going to the marketplace because the patients, uh, they didn't have enough electricity to uh, have fridge in their homes. I mean, the uh, power short uh, supply was not reliable or was not there at all. So people had to come to the market every single day to get their um, food. And if they came to the market, uh, then uh, there was no doctor, of course, in the market. But if they were sick and if they had to go to the doctor, then they had to walk four hours to get to a doctor. And then it's four hours back from the doctor. That meant they can't work that day. That meant they need to forego those wages and what are they gonna eat that day, right? So it was a matter of, you know, a choice uh, of, you know, whether not to eat anything, go hungry that day or go to the doctor. So of course people couldn't go to the doctor. So it was like only the rich was able to go to the doctor. and. She said, health is not a luxury, it's a right. So we gotta be able to get to these people and the current model doesn't work. So look at the idea. Oh, sorry, before the idea, there was one other thing she was mentioning, it's the doctor's pride. If you were able to get to the doctor, which there was very few doctors because most of the Nigerian doctors were gone to US, UK, Canada, where they can earn higher wages, of course. So there was very few doctors in the first place anyways. And if you get to the doctor, then you had to wait in the line. And okay, let's say you got to the doctor, then there's the doctor's pride, right? You can't talk to the doctor. The doctor is like half God, right? So there was all these issues, social issues, um, you know, cost issues, the cost of medical care was not high, but the, the cost of getting to the care was high. So what she did was remarkable. She actually got a canopy, a table and a chair, and she had a blood pressure meter on her. And she just sat in the marketplace. And she said, Mark, market doctors, people came and they were like, are you a nurse? Uh, and they, they, they couldn't get it. I mean, like woman, doctor, how can you be a doctor as a woman? So she had to gain their trust. So she had to uh, explain that she is a doctor and she's doing uh, consulting services. She started helping people free of charge for a while to get their trust, to earn the trust. And uh, she realized even though people... Uh, People, people thought they need to uh, they need to have good quality service. So they wanted to pay for her services. And they want to, to get uh, a, a continued service as well. So when she was you know treating somebody, she was you know looking uh, after somebody, they started saying, when are you going to come back? When are you going to come back? So she realized this is not gonna happen for like one or two days. So she had to have presence there on a you know, longer uh, stretch somehow. So um, she basically uh, 
have to partner with uh, an organization, right? To have stabilities, uh, to you know, to be present there more. And she went to international organizations, but they wanted government in the business. And she, since she's not government, international organizations didn't work for her. Um, so she said, okay, I'm gonna go knock on the doors of pharma and pharmaceuticals. They wanted their products to reach to the people in need. And she said, I have the people in need. You just give me your samples. Samples are free anyways. And I'm going to distribute your products. So that way I'm gonna be promoting your products and your products will be reaching the people in need. So that's how she started collaborating with pharma. And then uh, oil and gas came up. Oil and gas was working out in the middle of nowhere, totally remote, far, far away places, but they uh, wanted to help these people uh, with healthcare, but they weren't medical people themselves. So um, Yatunde said, I can help your people. You bring me those people and I'll provide the healthcare. You sponsor me. So that's how she started collaborating with oil and gas. In the meanwhile, she started market doctors, uh, meaning she started teaching regular people how to measure blood pressure, how to check vital uh, indicators. Uh, so she says, you don't need to be a doctor to measure blood or to measure fever or te take temperature or stuff like that. So she started teaching basic skills, like number of skills uh, to regular people. And plus the data from all these patients had to be gathered and kept so that they can actually, you know, follow up with what's going on. And uh, she started employing these people. So she generated employment and this started growing. In, uh, oh, uh, by the way, after a while, uh, her presence at the marketplace was not enough. So she, uh, she now has, as of August, 2023, she has seven mobile clinics and they're going out to where the people are. And uh, they got some investment uh, and they have a lab because they realize while uh, they, you know, the patients come and they say, you need to have this test, that tested. They want to send these people to the lab, but the same problem of long traveling long distances to the market anyways, is there for the lab. So they need to have, they needed to have this lab within their, um, their place. So now with the investment that they get, uh, they got, they have opened up this lab and now they're running their own tests. So, um, oh, by the way, they are now present in nine states and they're serving 152,000 people. They're growing and uh, they are able to get investment. So story number three is coming from South Africa, it's uh, originating from South Africa, but it's covering a large area. And again, it's um, we're going to be talking about Mothers to Mothers, which is founded by Dr. Mitch Besser, a gynecologist, American. And uh, when he got to South Africa in 2001, he didn't speak the local language, um, but he had one of his patients, um, translating uh, for him. Elaine was an HIV patient herself and Dr. Mitch uh, treated Elaine and Elaine uh, got over HIV. So um, since he couldn't speak the language and since she was translating uh, with the other patients, Dr. Mitch said, why don't you explain your story to these people? Like what you're doing now and how it was in the first place and Elaine, um, is telling HIV is not just any uh, kind of um, illness. Uh, there's isolation, there's shame in the community, and there's all this uh, cultural uh, depressive uh, things you need to deal with. And in addition to the fear of death, 
So uh, th there's all these issues that on a psychological level, you couldn't uh, mention, you couldn't talk with anyone unless you suffered it yourself. So the idea was born uh, that uh, these former patients of the doctor having overcome the illness can mentor other mothers so that the transmission of HIV from mother to child can be stopped. And that's how they started um, mentor mothering uh, kind of thing. Uh, Faustina, is a, her story starts in her sixth pregnancy in 2007. She, uh, her, she was diagnosed with HIV and her son was diagnosed with uh, HIV and tuberculosis and her husband uh, also TB and HIV. She lost both her son and her husband. She had a shop, she was uh, selling food and her customers after her uh, HIV status was announced somehow, her customers thought she would infect them with the food that she was selling. So they stopped coming. So she, with five kids, no husband, she lost her single source of income and she had to rely on church basically. Um, and she was basically trying to hold on by being with other HIV positive people, holding, trying to hold, hold on to life somehow. And uh, then in 2019, uh, she was employed by Mothers to Mothers, which generated the income that she needs. And now she's a team leader. She's teaching other mothers how to cope with this disease and how to uh, be, uh, how to live uh, and care for her kids. And this is not only HIV, there's uh, all sorts of diseases that they're teaching one another how to live with, how to um, protect themselves from. And this is class. Class is 18 years old. They're doing door to door visits, right? And they found Klaus and his 14-year-old brother um, in a home. When they knocked on the door, Klaus answered the door and he, they were orphans and they were trying to live on their own. So Klaus was 18, uh, graduated from high school and he, of course, wasn't able to go to college. So Mothers to Mothers registered him to I College and they gave him a job as a data filer at Mothers to Mothers. So now he has the job and he's working. He has an income, he can take care of his brother. Now, um, Mothers to Mothers is uh, growing. And even though it was founded in uh, South Africa, it's now growing to Angola, Ghana, Kenya, Lesotho, Malawi, all these different places. And um, at I would like to make a stop at this moment, and I want to say, so what? At least that's what I'm hearing you say, because you guys are not medical doctors, you're not nurses, and okay, so what? What if all these nice stories are happening? What does it have to do with innovation? What does it have to do with you? Uh, first of all, we're talking about these doctors looking at the same situation, which is people living in rural places, not having access to healthcare, hospitals, all uh, in urban places, not serving enough people, and infrastructure is rather poor, roads are either non-existent or rather bad, and people are relying on daily income, so they have to choose between work and healthcare. So these are very difficult uh, physical challenges. On top of this, the, there is the uh, social, cultural thing of shame and isolation and psychological depression and stuff like that. So all these people are able to see this but on top of this there's also this information africa's mobile cellular penetration as of 2021 is 
very high. The red zones are above 100%. So one person has more than one mo mobile phone. And the pinkish, reddish areas, uh, it just says Africa has good coverage of uh, cell phone. Also, rapid test kits for malaria, pneumonia, HIV, and all this stuff is there. I mean, with a, this little item, you can actually test for these diseases rather quickly. Uh, plus, electronic data management systems, you know, distance education, Zoom, and everything is there. That means there's a fertile ground for people to train one another on primary healthcare knowledge. And uh, when they do that, I mean, you don't need to go to the doctor for every single high temperature case or every single um, disease doesn't urgently require a doctor. You can actually go to your primary healthcare worker or person and learn from them and maybe they could treat the issue right away. So this way, Africa is basically flipping the healthcare model in the West. And Africa is saying, we're going to be applying the preventive healthcare system, leapfrogging the uh, bankrupt system in the West. Because in the West, even if you go to the hospital, you can't get hold of the doctor or not the right doctor. So it's all bankrupt. In the US, the medical system is bankrupt. It's not working. In Europe, it's very difficult, same thing. So what we need is preventive healthcare. And in order to do that, we need people to be trained so that they can do rapid tests, they can use a smartphone and they can get all this information to uh, medical professionals. And also, they, these organizations need to be scaling up, growing. That means collaboration. That's where you come in. So I need you to read this poem, please. This poem says, there's never gonna be the perfect time for starting anything. There's, there's no perfect, but if you go to the websites of Mothers to Mothers, Market Doctors, Last Mile Health, you see they have uh, career sections. So you can apply for a job, a real job, a paying job for these organizations. Or if you already have a job, you can get uh, a high school kid, apply for a job over here. Or if you're working at an institution, you can mm, call them up and say, how can we collaborate? How can we help? Because all of these organs and there's more of these these are only the three that i was able to cover in my time over here but there's more and preventive healthcare model is a brand new business model in terms of healthcare provision it's a different way of thinking and it doesn't rely on professional uh healthcare workers only it uses layman like people like you and me we just can learn how to read a blood pressure meter and we can be a community health worker. And this doesn't necessarily have to be only in Africa. It could be everywhere. We need this system. And it's a brilliant, brilliant model. And these people are doing a wonderful job uh, since 2001. The HIV cases have, uh, the transmission to kids have fallen. And now they're moving on to other cases. So uh, I provided the references in case you want to check them out over here. 
but um, I am now, I'm not gonna continue anymore. I need to stop right here and I wanna see what you need to say now. So I'm opening the floor to questions and comments. Let me stop sharing screen. How can I do that? Mm, yes. Ooh. Okay, 31 messages. Well, I don't I don't see any questions. Oh, okay. You can So Okay. But, but we have two two hands raised. Oben Valeri, he'll go first. If you can activate your microphone. There you go. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Lambert. It's a pleasure having you again. And hi, Doctor, for a wonderful presentation on the concept of innovative health in Africa. It's true that when I saw the topic, I it's like I was over I was over ambitious and set my objectives too high. So I was looking at something too far different from what she has presented. So but I'm so comfortable with the landscape and the what she has presented concerning that. Now, one issue I saw in the presentation, which is actually what has, been, what has always bothered me about the situation of healthcare systems in Africa, is the aspect of data. You know, in the present situation now, data has a very, very strong role to be, as far as policy, health policies are concerned. And uh, my, to the best of my knowledge, is a system where we are lagging. So if we have to look at all the Structure she has presented for the three. She has talked of uh, the market doctors, Nigeria. She has talked of uh, mothers to mothers, and so on. My concern is what is the disposition put by these people so that these data should be shared so that good policies could be implemented on at the level of decision, improve on healthcare in Africa. I am of the laboratory sector, and behold, it's very challenging as far as data sharing is concerned. Unfortunately, in the presentation, I didn't hear anything about, about that. So that is my concern now. Thank you so much. If I, I need to uh, confirm uh, that I'm understanding the question right, because I'm not sure I got the question right. Uh, are you asking, uh, there's issues with data sharing and uh, without the data sharing, it's going to be hard to uh, provide good health care. Is that the question? OK, thank you. I'll just take a small example for the case. Just take an example because we talk of the rapid diagnosis because I I uh, made mention that I come from the lab section where we, there is the thinking towards the direction of making available testing at community level, which means that households could be able to run particular tests, maybe to be able to have good information on how healthcare intervention could be done. But now the problem is centralization of this data that can equally help to make informed decisions that can improve on this aspect. So with the rapid testing in the community, I always say that the test is good is done because but now when it comes to the aspect of being able to use this data to collect a hundred of this data to inform where areas that is improved should be done. That is where we are lagging in terms of measure as far as innovation is concerned. So are they thinking of anything towards this direction? on how this data could be collected for the different aspects and this data to be shared so that more informed and innovative decisions could come up. I, I understand, but um, uh, I think there are still issues like the one that you're saying right now. I'm not a data specialist. Uh, I'm looking at it from a rather macro perspective or a meso perspective, maybe. But uh, obviously, uh, it, that is an issue that needs to be um, tackled. And I'm sure there's either a legal 
uh, aspect of it or like private uh, privacy issues with data sharing. I mean, that, that's still an issue everywhere, not only in Africa. So uh, it, it's a special um, case that needs to be studied from uh, technological and legal perspective. And I, I don't have enough knowledge uh, about that. But you might want to call them up, uh, the market doctors, for instance, and ask them, how do you deal with this data sharing issue? Or how did you come up with a different model as to how to deal with this thing? I, I think they're pretty open to talk. And because in all their websites, I've seen uh, get involved, get involved, let's work together, let's collaborate. So they are reaching out. And if you call them up, and if you start some kind of a talk, they might give you an idea of where to go, what to do. You might brainstorm with them, but I wouldn't be the right person to do that. All right, thank you. So you know, thank I just want to so say, when you're, when you're writing your essays for this topic, call those places, do an interview, get some information, and write about what they say in your essays. Okay, moving on. Emmanuel Aua. Thank you very much, doctor. And thank you so much, uh, presenter. In fact, I'm highly challenged uh, by this work done, leaving your comfort zone, touring Africa to this. I was just asking myself, how long did it take her to do all this, go to all these places and gather this information? So um, we are highly motivated. My field might not be healthcare, but then um, literacy, communication, I see my environment and community uh, this presentation is something that I can do to also support my community. But uh, my question comes this way. Um, I have lived with my mother um, all along and as a family, she's still with me. And I observe that um, even my own children, she is able to suggest with, they, they never have been to the hospital. Delivery, she does it. And whenever there is any problem, the child is feeling warm, hot, whatever, she will quickly say, go and buy this, go and buy that. And my mom just had primary middle education, did not. And it has happened. All my five kids, she's been the doctor doing all this. I don't know. Do you subscribe to this practice? Is that something we can do to modify it? That is one. And then two, during the COVID, there was an observation that people say, okay, let's take chloroquine. Um, let's take this herbs, whatever. There was something so unique about Africans, um, as we all have the records, the death toll was not that much. I don't know, through your research, uh, is there anything that you found so unique about Africans that made us thriving, surviving the pandemic, please? Thank you very much. Um, very good questions, by the way. Um, question number two, let me start with that. I found something very interesting uh, in my search uh, or research by the way it takes a lot of time but i love doing this so um what i found and uh, was pretty interesting because during covid uh, the the death toll in africa was people predicted there would be much many more deaths in africa than west and it didn't happen that way but uh, just because everybody else was closing down, Africa also closed down. And what happened was uh, the shots, uh, regular children uh, immunization uh, also stopped. And uh, that uh, schools were shut down. So children couldn't get to go to the schools and uh, regular protective preventive care for children was uh, stopped. And that's why many children uh, had to be hospitalized maybe because of children's diseases, not because of COVID, but that kind of diseases. And that's interesting. Um, and uh, the, so West, the West should stop thinking uh, Africa is going to, um, suffer the same as the West, because Africa is totally different. And as for the question number one, 
I agree, traditional conventional um, medicine uh, has its um, expertise in certain matters, but um, mothers, grandmothers, because of their experience, they have tacit knowledge, like my grandmother was the same, like when we were falling sick, I mean, grandmother at home or mom, she knows. So first, the first doctor is always the mother, of course, at home. I mean, you don't just go to the doctor all of a sudden. First, you ask your mother or grandma, and they know. And sometimes they know more than the doctors, you know. Um, and um, and so it has to be a blend of conventional and traditional uh, knowledge of old women, uh, because plant medicine. Plant medicine is coming back huge. I don't know about Africa, but in the West, in Germany, in Russia, plant medicine is coming back. I mean, every I know for a fact there's certain um, herbs that is good for certain diseases, but the West is not knowledgeable enough, or they're more into surgery and neuroscience, we'll go to stuff like that. But there's primary, very uh, primary knowledge that the conventional uh, medicine does not know or does not somehow uh, address. So I'm not saying uh, uh, go and you know drop your grandmother thing knowledge thing. I'm saying use both. But there's like when your arm breaks. Of course, you have to go to the hospital because for these kind of things, the mm, conventional medicine is good. But at certain other cases, uh, there is room for home medicine, let's say. Uh, homeopathy is coming back in Germany big time. Um, US. Uh, I don't know. I heard a couple of friends saying uh, they are now paying for insurance is now paying for homeopaths. Uh, so homeopathy is being accepted now. So I think in certain instances, traditional, conventional Western medicine is going to catch up with uh, what our grandmothers knew. But at the moment, we're kind of like we need to do the preventive thing as well. Now we go to Angelina Jamba. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank good you afternoon. so much, uh, <laughs> Ellen Lambert. And just to share, we, I'm really grateful that we had this topic. Hopefully, we'll have more about it. Actually, when I got the, the invitation for this, I said, Africa, Africa is broad. So where, which country? Since I'm from Angola. I'm medical technologist by profession, and I agree 100% that preventive healthcare is very, very important. And what I was, uh, I used to do when I worked in the hospital, now I am not working, but probably uh, within some few months, I will be uh, going back to the hospital to healthcare. It's like I had to go to the villages to search for the children who were with malaria and with low blood. I brought them to the hospital and by, I brought them to the hospital and I gave a uh, blood transfusion and those, those children were really got well. Because sometimes also the mothers will do some kind of medicine, but it will not help in case of malaria if they will not give maybe the correct herb it will not help. And they will, um, they will stay at home for a long time. And sometimes when they get to the hospital, it's very, very late. And they get, um, the children really died. It's like when I worked in one of the hospital, three children actually died in my hands, but because it was too late and they could have been saved. 
And now that I'm prepared also myself to go to Congo, it is really good for me so that I can have some something to start and how to start it. And sometimes what I uh, mean, it's like uh, sometimes there is no cooperation. We need to be united so that you can make a difference in this world so that this world can be a better place to live not only europe or america but africa as well so thank you so much i hope to see you again dr early thank you dr lambert and see you uh, angelina it's a pleasure to have someone uh, confirming uh, yes. what i'm saying in terms of preventive and i think uh, you know much more than I do, obviously. I'm not coming from a medical well, background, we... but um, it's it's good to know that you're supporting. And I think if you can reach out to these institutions, they might, uh, I don't know, they might have a couple of tips for where you can get started in Congo, maybe, or maybe they're already present somehow, and maybe they can give you um, a touch as to where to do what kind of thing. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelina, for your question and your comment. Thank you, Dr. Uh, we're going to Dr. Jane. Can you go ahead and activate your microphone? Dr. Dane Tochuku. Dr. Jane Tochuku. There you go. I think you're activated Good now. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. Go ahead with your question. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation on innovation and healthcare in Africa. From my own perspective, Africa is like we are a moon system is strong in health purposes. One, when you talk of malaria in America, Europe, it's a very high disease and they treat it with caution. Here in Nigeria, malaria is one of the less diseases we suffer and we take care of it with a mild health care. Now, when you talk of um, all these uh, big diseases like cancer, HIV and AIDS, yes, it's properly is done. We, we experience it here in Africa. But in Africa, it is not as much as in European world. Why? From my own thinking and observation, it is caused by high fertilized food, intake, high canned food intake. Here in Africa, we depend more of green food, pastured food. So due to that, we are, our immune system is more stronger than them up there in Europe and America. Irrespective that healthcare Yes, they have fantastic experience and experts in medical line in respect to that. Now, secondly, in Africa, we see all these big diseases as major diseases, which everybody is looking at. And we do ignore the small ones that even kills more deadly than these ones we are talking about. Something like hepatitis B, which when you do the test is only when you are pregnant as no normal routine test of a pregnant woman for antenatal, they do that. But as normal, even a childbirth and all these injections they give in Africa, I don't think this is one of priority they do to have this test of hepatitis B and its infection and prevention. So my question is, how are we going to manage this in Africa so that this kind of less 
as we are saying it, less disease pandemic should be implemented in the hospitals and clinics, both private and government clinics in Africa, so that it will go as a routine check or routine test to every hospital. Yes. Because it's deadly than the world we are seeing and we are perspective. Thank you. Jane, I think uh, I don't have any answer to your question, but I, uh, I agree about uh, the artificial food that we're eating all over the world is making us sick. That's, that's for sure. Um, because when we were kids, we didn't have all this um, chemical fertilizer stuff. But now uh, we simply are bombarded with all sorts of chemicals in the food. Now we cannot protect ourselves uh, unless we're raising our own food, but I'm not growing my own food. So I have to go and buy stuff from the market. And that means I'm vulnerable to whatever they're feeding me. And basically we're all prone to disease, whether in Africa or elsewhere. So um, I wish we could be eating green and organic food, but that doesn't exist at least at the moment, but hopefully it will someday. So that will reduce our dependence uh, on hospitals. Uh, but on the other hand, as far as routine checks, uh, how could it happen? I have no idea. But what I saw in my research is if preventive health care can be disseminated, if the knowledge for primary health care can be done through Zoom calls, through, um, I don't know how, but like information uh, dissemination is easy now uh, because people have smartphones. So if we can apply the, 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 the key idea in the um, class is preventive health care uh, requires education. It's, it's not ne neurosurgical education. It's primary healthcare education, which is not rocket science. So uh, if people can actually uh, get training on primary healthcare, how to keep clean, how to have clean water, how to be more hygienic, uh, at least washing hands with soap, stuff like that. I mean, primary health care. So that could reduce the number of tests uh, or uh, the rapid tests to be done. I'm not sure about how it can be done in the hospitals because it's really not my area of expertise. So I can't speak about that. So that's all I can say on that. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Jane, for your... Uh... Your question. Let's go now to Obeida Yusuf. Uh, hello. Hi. Hello, hello. Dr. Elf. Uh, it was really nice uh, hearing you, and we got a motivated by the three stories you gave us. Uh, it's really been nice to be in this presentation. I'm a teacher by profession, and I'm in Zanzibar here. So the way you were saying about the mobile clinic and all, we had a mobile clinic campaign just uh, um, one month ago, and I had participated in um, drawings on the mobile clinic. So yeah, we in Zanzibar also we are do, we are trying our level best to reach the remote areas. But I think yeah, the way you said, uh, we still need uh, to really take care because there are so many remote areas where they don't have health uh, care. And I visited in one of the health. Uh, I visited one of the remote areas. And I saw so many children having a polio, and uh, they had uh, they were blind. Someone, some could not hear. I think the they they missed that uh, starting vaccination. Uh, so as a teacher, uh, yes, I'm dealing with students with children. So I would really love uh, your idea, the way you say that uh, you are going to train. Is it? Uh, am I not um, uh, mistaken? You said. You're going to train us so we can do some simple, is it? Some simple. Uh, it, uh, yes, 
um, it's not me who's going to do the training, but you can go to the websites of Last yeah. Mile Health, Mothers to Mothers, oh, okay. and uh, yeah, Market The, the Doctors. stories you shared with us, yeah. Yes, I mean, these are real people. These are real organizations, and they are looking for community health workers. So they do train people. So if you knock on their door, and if you say, I'm willing to uh, be a community health worker. Uh, they have mm. different names, community ambassador, community health worker, whatever. I mean, they have different names, but they pay you as a career. You can actually be their employee, or maybe you can ask for training and you can do a part-time thing. I'm not really sure uh, how many different modes of um, partnership they have, but they are open to partnership. They're open to working together. What they want is commitment. So, I mean, if I were them, I wouldn't uh, rely on every single person coming in. I wouldn't say, mm -hmm. come on, come on. I would test them and I would see if they're committed, if they're serious about this, then I will take them in because they're going to invest in you. They're going to train you and they want to rely on you. So, you know, if you look at it from their perspective, that's what they're looking for in people. But from your perspective, you want people to, to give you knowledge and mm. you just need to knock on their door, write them an email, ask for a phone number. I mean, they already have their phone numbers. You can call them up if there's one in Zanzibar or mm. uh, maybe in a next door country. I'm not sure, but um, they might refer you to another organization. I mean, these are only three that I was able to report here, but there are more of these. Like mm -hmm. uh, Merck, the uh, pharmaceutical was working with nurses and they are coming up um, with a, another project they have finalized the pilot project and it's successful but i don't remember uh, in which countries they're uh, present so i mean there's if you just look up uh, healthcare innovation startups healthcare startups uh, for preventive care i mean the the keywords will change primary healthcare um, and you're going to find at least a number of these startups and you can ask them how can i help how can i get training for my children i would like to you know teach this to my kids in class yeah and their families so hmm. maybe they can pay you maybe they can sponsor your training hmm. in a way so you know when you're talking with them you can find a way to start a new model Thank you so much. Thank you. This is great. I am putting links in chat on how to contact these places, the, their contact page. Okay, Perfect. let's go to Agnes Nabi Subi. Go ahead and activate your microphone. There you go. Okay. How are we doing on yes. time? Hello. No, Hello. Hi. Can you hear? Yes, we can hear Hi. you. Good evening. Hi. I'm fine. I'm from Uganda, Kamara. For I've been working with people in the community about about teaching them how to keep the environment clean, how to eat her food, how to be a drinker. But the challenge of course, uh, people, when you go out, the people, they think you are, you have thunder from the West, all the other uh, find you, you have a lot of money, and they think of, like, you're going to give them money, even the political leaders, whom you think would help you to put this thing forward, to carry on the, the voluntary work. So it becomes a challenge for us here to help other people, because there are many, especially me, in older persons, how to, to train them to grow health vegetables, uh, backyard farming, to, to eat health so that they live longer. 
and the children and the care we I try to talk to them to, to help these people. But whenever you go out in the community, people think you've got a bag of money. So sometimes you have to go, they come and they think you give them money, then you don't have the money, you're using your personal resources to help them. Anyway, I don't know what advice or what can we do about that like for us here in Uganda? Agnes, your connection was very poor, so I, I have a hard time understanding the question. I think you were asking something to do with money. Hello. If you can hear me now. Hello? Can you hear me now? If you can type can it in the chat, I, I have a hard time hearing you. Hello. Yes, Agnes um, Nabi, Nabisubi, it's better to write your question into chat. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, can I can you hear me now? Yeah, I was saying. It's, yeah, it's I was saying that we, however much you want to do voluntary work here in our communities. Like for me, example, I, I deal with older people in my community and trying to educate them. I am not a professional health work, though I would love to be. But when you go and do the community, they think you are going to get money there. You, just, you have service funding you. They don't come with a motive of getting the knowledge you are giving them, but they are looking out for you to get money. And yet you're using your personal resources to facilitate them, to help them. But the challenge is, how can we change the mindset that people think whenever you take a service to them, that you are going to give them money or you have someone behind you who is giving you a lot of money and they start thinking that instead of giving them money, you are eating it. So it becomes a challenge for us here to, to help people to, to go into communities to help people because of that mindset. I don't know how we can advise us on continuing with our voluntary work. Thank Agnes, you very much. Agnes, I would recommend you to talk with Dr. Yetunde, for instance. This is a question for her because I haven't been in your shoes and I don't know uh, how to convince these elderly people to trust you and how to stop expecting money from you. But I'm sure uh, these people um, might have an idea. I mean, they, they probably have um, gone through things like this when they got started. I mean, it's not pink rose gardens. We're not talking about perfect, wonderful paradise. No, they suffered a lot. Like Dr. Yatunde is saying, she had to go bankrupt so many times and she had to get up again. It's fail, uh, up again, fail, start again. It's definitely very difficult. This is not a fairy tale. This is a success story. So it's a matter of learning. That's why I don't have the answer to this question, but I would suggest you contact with these people, uh, like the mentor mothers in Mothers to Mothers. You, can you don't need to talk to Dr. Mitch. You don't need to talk to the doctors. You can talk to one of the women themselves. I mean, you can contact these people. These are real people. And you can ask for their emails. You can just talk to any of the mentor mothers. Because these are regular mothers like me. I'm a mother. And if I was in Africa, I would be trained by one of these mothers. And that means these people know the challenges of being a mother, the challenges of talking to other mothers or other, the people in the community. So you should reach out to them and talk, ask your questions to them because they have, they might have the answers to your questions. I'm not sure. 100%, but I would suspect they might be going through the same things as you do. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks so much. You're welcome.
All right. Thank you so much, Agnes Navisubi. Let's go to Angiola Alemola. Go ahead and activate your microphone. Good to see you today. Hi, good evening, sir. Good to see you today, sir. So I have a question to the presenter, and I would like to ask Dr. Edward a question, too. Uh, so talking about healthcare innovation in Africa, what would you say is the larger, from the map opposition sensors that you displayed for 2021, what would you say is the biggest sector that is facing the healthcare innovation challenge in Africa currently? And what do you see as the exact activities that will take place going ahead? I didn't understand the question. Okay, so what would you say is the biggest sector? The that biggest is facing the sector. Healthcare? Yeah, Western healthcare innovation in Africa. Oh, there's so many. I can't even. It's just a matter of which one would you like to pick? It's uh, see, that's mm, mm, I don't know what to say to that because sky is the limit. I mean, there's all sorts of diseases. There's uh, psychological issues. There's kids, but. It depends on where you're looking at it from. There's the macro policy perspective. There's the micro peer-to-peer -peer perspective. There is the education perspective. It's all intermingled. But I would say start small with small, real problems. Very small. Maybe just one kid. Just take one kid to... Uh, man to mother and listen to where he's suffering in terms of what disease or whatever and learn how you can teach this kid how to be more clean maybe or i don't know maybe just take three kids from your family cousins maybe i don't know nieces nephews and just t measure their arms in terms of malnutrition I mean, it looks pretty easy to me. And it, it, just to see if they're ma not nourished enough. Or if they are, then they, for a game, just give them the meter and say, why don't you measure each other's friends' arms and see if people are nourished enough? I don't know. Just make something up in terms of getting started with something. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Angela. Uh, Salisu Patlamasi, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, Hello. Thank you so much, Ma, for the wonderful presentation. It's always uh, a pleasure to see you, Dr. Edward, good to see you once again. Good to see you uh, too. Yes, sir. Uh, so as I saw the topic, uh, healthcare innovation in Africa, you know, it's really touched someone that, oh, since we are talking of Africa, let us also make sure we participate in this for better Africa. So my, I heard you uh, said, uh, in the story you give us about Nigeria, of course, I'm from Nigeria, uh, that only the rich goes to the doctor. Uh, maybe those days or you are still talking about now. So I want to use this opportunity to tell you that uh, things have really changed and uh, not really like uh, uh, what they used to say, yeah, there are a lot of challenges in Africa. I am a military personnel uh, serving with the Nigerian Air Force, and I know the capacity of uh, uh, Nigerian military uh, uh, medical personnel because I was in Sudan in 2012 uh, as a peacekeeper with the United Nations. And I know there is uh, this Nigerian level two hospital that were deployed in 2012, you know, in, in charge of giving health care to, to different uh, contingents uh, that are in that location. 
and the lockers, also in Mali, in Liberia, and the rest. So there, there are a lot of uh, also references to how many doctors you have, for example, in the United States of America, who are also from Nigeria, who have left in one way or the other because of uh, the higher pay uh, to Saudi Arabia and the rest. So just to correct uh, that impression that uh, it's only the rich goes to the doctor in Nigeria. It's not really so at this current moment. Uh, we have a lot of uh, hospitals, but the issue of population, you know, Africans usually give birth to more than five, more than three. Sometimes the, the, the doctors available cannot cater for the number of Africans. Now I'm talking of Africa in general because of the high rate of uh, uh, giving birth. So there are these challenges that uh, you see uh, uh, where you have women and uh, at home uh, in terms of labor, where if there is a sudden labor, a woman will quickly go to that house and receive the baby uh, 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 and, and everything goes well without any challenge. Maybe the next day they rush to the hospital. So we have challenges definitely. And we pray that one day the doctors that always eye abroad will also stay home uh, uh, and, and give us uh, the medical care in Africa. Lastly, uh, in 2022, uh, there is a vice president, uh, Yemi Osibanjo, who chose to be treated in the uh, uh, Duchess International Hospital in Ikeja for a fracture, a surgical operation to correct a fracture in his right uh, femur. I'm not a medical doctor, but uh, it is spelled F-E-M-U-R, despite the advice of his doctors for him to go abroad. As a vice president, he insisted that he wants to do the surgery in Nigeria, which he did it, and he is better now. So uh, that is just that impression. And uh, I say lastly, I'm sorry to say lastly again, uh, this one is the caution I have uh, for you, Ma. Why do doctors go to internet for consultation? You know, uh, as a medical doctor who is certified to be a medical doctor, why during consultation, a doctor has to go to internet and search for, 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 for solution to a particular problem. Does that really uh, 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 affect the, 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 the doctors we are producing these days? Or what do you say about that? Thank you so much for your time. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, uh, I have run across the uh, good education the good med medical education in Nigeria, and that's why uh, Nigerian doctors are in demand in US, Canada, and UK. And okay. that's why uh, the number of doctors is not enough in okay. Nigeria. And that's why market doctors was initiated in Nigeria. I'm not saying the Nigerian medical care is insufficient in terms of knowledge. Okay. All I'm saying is the number of people Nigerian doctors are able to serve is limited with the urban people and the remote uh, locations yes. are uh, suffering from, you know, not being able to access. Uh, and I'm not saying it's only for the rich. Okay. I was, I was quoting what okay. Yetunde, Dr. Yetunde was saying that, uh, health is a right and it shouldn't be uh, dependent on financial uh, means. And she says the cost of medical services per se is not that high, but getting to the medical services, getting, I mean, they need to walk 
all the way to the hospital or the doctor. And that means they're going to forego the wages of that day because they're, some of the population is living on daily income. So that means either they're going to have food or doctor. Mm -hmm. Of course, they will have to choose the food and let go of the doctor. But if the doctor is available in the general community place, which turns out to be the market in certain places in Nigeria and maybe elsewhere, then doctors, instead of being in the hospital, some, some of them could be doing surgery in the hospitals, that's fine. But some of them could be in the marketplace. What a brilliant idea. And people say, I mean, Dr. Yetunde says, people do trust me as a doctor. Okay. And even if I'm not at the hospital, my okay. medical knowledge is here and they yeah. do trust me as a woman, uh, yeah. even though it takes time for them to uh, trust me from being a nurse to a doctor. When yeah. they do, I can serve them and I can help them. And and in every case, I they don't need my knowledge. So the people that I train are able to help them. Yeah. by uh, the knowledge that they're doing, by the testing, by the follow-up work. I mean, this is a very different way of approaching to healthcare provision. So, yeah, 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 he has a graduate from about two years ago who was setting up satellite health clinics throughout the rural areas of Nigeria. Wow. And we just had a graduate about two months ago who's going to do the same thing in the United States. Wow. And they're, they're, what they're, 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 they plan to work with uh, hospitals in the city, and then the, the hospitals will basically subsidize and supervise the satellite clinics so, so that women don't have to go four hours on a bus when they're pregnant. So they can just go you know, just close by. So there's, we, we have AIU graduates working on this, but there needs to be more. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's the message. That is exactly what I'm trying to say. We need to have more people mm -hmm. aware of this need in the market. And we don't need to be doctors to yes. help. Okay. This. That's all I'm saying. As far as uh, the last question, I don't know what to say. Um, I, 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 but I hope <laughs> that's all I have to say. I can't answer for everything. I don't know everything. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Salisu. Thank you, sir. <laughs> now we go to Monica Derry. If you can activate, activate your microphone. Let's try that again. Monica. Monica Derry, can you activate your microphone? Oh, Monica Derry is asking the question over here. Oh. Chicken pox is on the rise this few months. How do we come back it in terms of first aid before seeking professional treatment in the hospital? Asking this because some communities have challenges to health facilities and we'll have. Um, Monica, I'm not a health professional. I think I would refer you to Mothers to Mothers, Last Mile Health, and uh, the ones that I'm uh, talking about. Why don't you go and ask them what you can do? Uh, even Angelina might help you here. Angelina Jamba is coming from a medical background. So uh, anyone who's in the group with a medical background might um, help Monica here. Maybe you guys might want to exchange emails because I'm not the right person to answer that question. Isn't there another organization like Doctors Without Frontiers, Doctors Without Borders? Yeah, Doctors Without Borders. Yeah, there we go. So really seriously, there are so many job opportunities in healthcare. Even if you're a business major, even if you're a statistics major, public health major, accounting major, marketing, teaching, education, there are so many jobs available that you have you just find 
Can you can you speak to that? Oh yeah, I mean, like um, when I was going around collecting information, uh, since I'm not from Africa, I I had to spend hours. And yes, there is all sorts of there's logistics. If you have a mobile mo motorbike, logistic uh, carrying, uh, bringing forth uh, stuff, materials, even without any college education, if you're a high school kid. You can help, you can find a job in healthcare because they need people. I mean, because I looked at the what types of jobs they're advertising, these uh, institutions, and they're looking for IT people, they're looking for marketing people, any type of, you can imagine. Um, so just go and check out their websites because uh, there's a lot of, especially with IT, obviously IT is huge. Mm, but even with a ba business background, you can do so many things. We, and, I just put a, I just put a link to Doctors Without Borders. Yeah, but if yeah. you have a major of conflict resolution, international relations, uh, there's just so many different majors that are that you study that can be applied to helping this healthcare situation. It's not just public health majors. No, it's a lot no, more, more than that. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, even, just even engineering, construction, you know, get involved in building these clinics. Things yeah. like that. Yeah. Go go ahead. I mean, yeah, I mean, I agree. It doesn't necessarily what they want is commitment and what they want is will to help. If you want to contribute in one way or another, they can just look at what you have, what kind of skill you have available and they can put you where you're needed or you can say i can learn what they need is a willingness and commitment then they will invest in you because this is this is growing uh, at a tremendous rate people need healthcare and people are willing to spend money in it so this sector is going to grow and it's um, intersecting with um, education, training, long distance calls. So I don't know. I mean, the uh, opportunities are countless. The demographics of the world are changing. China, China does not have a younger population. And so it's going to turn to Africa in about 20 years, like you were saying before, in a, in a previous live class it's going to turn to africa in about 20 years to be the basically the workers of the world there's going to be a lot of manufacturing so the healthcare is going to be building really fast over the next two decades because you yeah, have to take you have to take care of the workers the median age of africa is 19.2 and the median age of europe is 44 something so uh, europe is old and Africa is the future. Everybody knows this. So you need to get hold of uh, the growth in Africa, the opportunities. I mean, it's not only healthcare, it's agriculture, it's healthcare, finance, whatever. It's just uh, everybody's jewel, the new jewel is Africa. So you need to watch. There's a lot of opportunities for growth in Africa. So just money, watch. Money, money is starting to turn towards Africa right now. Yeah, exactly. Within the next, right now, over the next couple of years, you're going to see a lot of money moving towards Africa because people oh, now yeah. realize the demographics are changing. And uh, big pharma companies uh, at the TED Talk, I don't know if you guys know about TED Talk, big pharma companies are uh, realizing the money is in Africa. So that's what, what I'm saying is they're not trying to come to rip you off, but they know they, uh, the growing population uh, is in Africa. There is need, there is wherever there's a demand for services, there is uh, opportunity for making money. So instead of bringing their old models, they're coming out with new technologies and you guys need to hold on to your local knowledge i'm not saying give away everything of course you have very important local knowledge like 
herbal medicine, medicine, women, and all that kind of thing. That's on one side that has to be researched, that has to be, you know, collected and uh, drawn upon. And, but then there is internet, there's communications, there's phone. So this kind of um, communication technology is available. So it's going to change the social structure of Africa and it's going to leapfrog, it's going to make Africa leapfrog development very, very quickly. And I'd like to say some people worry about the cor corruption in government that's going to block all this. Well, no. in, the, in the past, China could take all the workers, so you could have this corruption in Africa and really not affect economic growth in the world. But in the years that are coming, Africa is going to be the number one place for economic development for the world. Yes, yes. These, so these international businesses that are going to be investing in Africa are not going to tolerate corruption because they have to have the workers. They have to have these things be successful. So they're going to have to work around the corruption and stop it to make these things happen. Otherwise, there's no other place to go in the world. Exactly. Exactly. So, and transparency. So, go, go, ahead, go ahead and continue that thought. The internet, internet and communications and phones, uh, all this information availability is bringing transparency. When there is transparency, corruption is very difficult. Uh, we, we weren't transparent before, but now anything that sucks is right out on the screen. It's right out there. And big corporations have to go and provide service. They cannot mess around anymore. So they need to provide service. And they can because they need to make money. Making money doesn't mean ripping people off. There's a difference between, you know, ripping people off and cheating people, deceiving people. No, regular people need to make money and contribute by serving communities. So with transparency, this is what's happening now. That's why corruption needs to decrease. It, 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 it will happen automatically. I agree with Dr. Lambert. Yeah, just like climate change is starting to happen. You know, you mm -hmm. talk about it and all of a sudden it starts to happen. This is, this is what's gonna happen in Africa. We're talking about it, but you're gonna see it happening year by year, growing, get involved. Definitely. Uh, let's go to Ola Supo. How are we doing on time? No, we got time. I'm fine. You yeah, fine. Thank you, Dr. Lambert. Yes, I was. Uh, I like to thank the lady for a job well done, and I like to make a comment about the guy who said doctors always consult the internet. I believe that definition of knowledge, uh, wisdom, is correct application of knowledge, and uh, uh, like we say, things are changing fast. So if you are a doctor and you know that there can be new development from the time you saw your patient who had that type of ailment you are confronted with, I think it's wisdom for you to consult the internet to see whether there are new developments so that you are not belonging to the old school. That is why it is necessary, it is not out of place for a doctor to consult the internet. After all, in the legal profession, that is what to call precedence. If there is a decision of the high court and a student is doing an exam, uh, as of yesterday, the decision was by high court. And if, if before the exam period, there is a change of principle and that the, what was obtained before is no more obtained, then if the, doc, if the student should refer to the old one, he's going to fail the exam. So which means that you have to update yourself so those doctors who consult the internet are trying to update themselves, not because of lack of knowledge, but what I call wisdom, because wisdom is correct application of knowledge. That is my contribution. Thank you. Knowledge, education. Yes. 
you know, I'll go to, back to that one point about workers in the world in the future. You know, it just came out in the past week that Mexico, when they did their census and they got their demographics, they don't have, they, they, everybody was surprised because the younger generation shrunk by a huge amount. So they're also going through that demographic where the younger generation is, is not there anymore. So there's not going to be workers even from Mexico. The United States and Canada are both depending on Mexico right now for a lot of workers. And we're now seeing in this past week that the numbers just aren't there. There's not going to be workers in about 10, 20 years. That's why Africa is just going to really pop out in, in, over time here. And people are realizing this. And they're going to start looking, you know, oh, the demographics of Africa, the average age is 19. Hmm. Right. That's going to change everything. Yeah. Go with the thought. Perfect. I mean, I have nothing to say. It's, I mean, it's right there. The statistics are there. The investment pouring in uh, is there. Nigerian uh, Ministry of Health, I think, made a call to the world come to Nigeria and invest in preventive health care. And that is just perfect, perfect timing. There's, this is time for investment in people in Africa. Elif Kalesha, do you think you could do a class on, uh, how do I want to put this? Getting involved in that money flowing to Africa? And where's that money coming from? Where's it going? I, I could look into finance uh and I, because i mean it's big time the fintech innovation uh is many times faster than healthcare innovation that's what i saw in terms of numbers but i'm not sure i i i can definitely look into it uh but if you could just give me a little more um questions as to guide me in what sense we could do that maybe because I don't want to do it, you know, in uh, the way that I get it, but I need to do it the way you want it. So maybe we could do it over email or something. So you would need more focus, like a focused area, like healthcare. Uh, yeah, like a frame. Well, it could be. I mean, see, we, I need I need more framework in this. I could do that, but I need more framework because it's such an open topic. Yeah, if you could think for a second, what type of topics you would like to be presented mm -hmm. about African development, go ahead and write those into chat. And so that'll bring up some ideas. People, All right. uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, this question is to people, right? Yes. Yeah, because I'm thinking there's finance, there's education. Those two are major things we need to be covering. <coughs> because anything that has to do with investment in Africa, but th those are my perceptions, but you guys know better. Let's go to Odu Onyegaba. I think you okay, can go. Yeah. There you go. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lambert, and thank you so much, our dear presenter, for this um, topic and um, for this focus, really. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Beautiful. Um, so uh, I I think it's it's um, it's very instrumental right now because there's so so much going on in Africa with respect to um, being the foundation, still holding on to the foundational structures of um, the health system. Them, which um you know is driving still with with uh um it's it, i i want to move the um focus a little bit to holistic therapy um mm -hmm. and you know looking at the fact that um prevention you know the, the things sound is cutting out some mm -hmm. So holistic, that we, you, you know, we consume in our, uh, you know, um, lines of uh, survival and looking at the, the, the nutrition and, um, you know, the herbs for our healing, um, you know, and, and saying it's, there's so much, I know that my, my,
great grandfather, for instance, was a herbalist. But then, of course, he he. Um, the question I, I really want to put out is how do we how do we get to her nurse? Um, you know, to to actually get most of this information stored. Udo, your connection is kind of problematic. I I'm not sure. How do we push that it. knowledge? you know, acquisition, and it's fading out at a time when the Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, from time to time, yes. Oh, sorry. The network is um, not very... So are you asking the question, how are we going to get uh, knowledge in elderly people's minds out somehow? Is that what you're asking? Because... I'm not sure if I get the question right. All of the information, you know, is being stored. How, how do we gather up this information so we don't... Well, well you need to do interviews, qualitative research. You have to Lose talk. it with the older generations. About exactly. Health you, have and to healing. Talk with these, you have to talk with these old people and you, you need to uh, record all this data and then you have to transcribe them and then you need to uh verify them like maybe you got to be talking to 50 100 different elderly people and you have to triangulate them because you know you can't rely on a single source of knowledge but most of the time when these people die this information is going to die so you need to be talking with them and you probably need to write a project grant and get a grant for this to be uh, funded because it's going to require some time, at least on your side. <clears throat> but uh, if you can get some holistic uh, institution to support you, you could get the grant uh, because this is very important information. Um, so... Mm -hmm. It, I mean, it, it, it's it's not something that has not been done. Uh, original data collection is expensive and it's time consuming, but it's definitely worth the investment. Uh, so you just need a little bit. How can I go and do this research or at least go and check out the literature on how to do original data collection qualitative way? So whether it's medical information, whether it's herbal information, doesn't matter, any kind of qualitative data collection, that's where you need to go. Because these people, it's time sensitive. When they die, knowledge will die. So you gotta do yeah. it instantly, as soon as possible. Okay, so which actually leads me to uh, the to appreciating um, the contribution question that Dr. Lambert put forward. To say, um, it cut up, but I think she's talking about the demographics, and that's yeah. just building upon how do what, we get funding to oh, to funding. How do you get funding? Yeah, there's all kinds of places around the world that are moving money. Mm -hmm. Funding. get these things done because they're really critical i mean i've seen youtube channels put out videos about a documentary about a certain situation in certain parts of africa and the next thing the next thing they say we, we just need fourteen thousand dollars this one video said but they ended up with eighty thousand and then they had to tell everybody to stop giving they had too much they were getting too much money from this one youtube video so if you do a nice video, you know, get someone, to, a traveler to come in there and do a video, they can, they can write off the trip on their taxes, you know, get them to come in, do a documentary in a situation, they write it up on their taxes, and then they, they basically do a documentary film about something you need, and then put it out there on YouTube, and the money starts coming in. And you might find you get more money than you need. And then you can use the extra money for other projects. And that's that's happening a lot. And that's just one option. I wonder if I can find well, you 
Elif, go ahead and talk about that while I try and look for that video on YouTube. Um, there is a uh, crowdfunding. Okay, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, if you know of any crowd Kickstarter, uh, if you just say crowdfunding, um, crowdfunding is a, a way of collecting money for a cause. Okay, if you write up uh, what you want to do this for, like there's all this. Uh, information that is going to get lost with uh, the, my grandparents' generation dying. So we got to get this holistic um, plant knowledge, herbal treatment, whatever. So I'm going to need $10,000. And with the <clears throat> recipes that I'm going to get from these people, I'm going to uh, develop these into, I don't know, um, creams or whatever and I can send them over to you or whatever so like there's little or you don't even have to produce any product you can just collect the uh, information and you can share the information with the people even that would be worth investing in so if you open up this project at a crowdfunding platform and there's many of them uh, then you can you can start getting money but you have to be transparent okay you got to be very responsible and then you need to collect uh, the names of these people and you have to let them know where you are you have to report as to how the project is going um and all that so you this is this is serious business and you can do it you need to look into other crowdfunding projects, how they have been done before, read about it, how original data collection uh, kind of research is done, read about it, go to YouTube, check out other people who have gone through this path before, and maybe get a mentor on how to do research, original data collection kind of research. Okay, and put that on your board of advisors so that when you have a hard time, you can go and ask someone who knows, right? So I just put I just put into chat that link to mm -hmm. that YouTube video where they're showing a slum area that on the waters in the Delta area of the Nigerian of Nigeria. And at the end, they're asking basically for fourteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars to build an orphanage. But if you go down into the description of the video where down below they talk about it they say orphanage we have surpassed our goal for the money raised please see pinned comment below so they're basically saying you don't need to send any more money wow. <laughs> they had 14,000 wow. they had 14,841 comments on this video 14,000 comments That, that tells you the power of YouTube to find money for your projects. You just need someone to film it. And, and, and he's interviewing people along the way inside there, asking them what they need. And you can see the hearts of those people and the way they live and the, and the beauty inside of them. And it's like, okay, let's help, right? And the, the, this, this, ah, what can I say? The video speaks for itself. Thank who's you next? very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, who who's next? Elif, who's who's next? Um, I think we have two hands, but I'm not sure. Angela. Okay, we'll go. Uh hi again. Okay, hi. so this question is actually for the Fed. I actually dropped it on the chat. So I just wanted to make a comment. Thank you. Can't really hear anymore. I was asking if I could, because I was thinking of, of creating a, a support for a support first, and maybe like a presentation on an on African studies, general African studies. So I'd like to know what the process is. I'm not really able to understand. Maybe you can type your question in the chat. Okay, let me type it. Okay. Oh, 
We hope you're getting some great ideas here. Oh, email. Oh. We hope you're getting some great ideas on what you can do for work, opportunities, and, re and realize that there's real people around the world who are just sitting in their houses. They're not organizations. Yeah. And, they, and they give money. So you don't have to go to these international organizations. You can just go through social media and find thousands upon thousands of people interested to help. It's possible. It is possible. I was to create a course in a live class or African says and also pick great ideas from this class. So uh, I think this is a question to Dr. Lambert. Dr. Lambert, uh, Angela is asking you. Uh, to create a course in live class. I think I think what he's doing. I, I think he wants to offer teaching a live class on yeah. some on some issues. Yeah. And that you'll have to contact. Just send us. Just send an email to me, and I'll 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 find out what has to be done. Mm -hmm. Does uh, your you... email work, or how can we be in contact? Okay, I guess let me put my email in there too. Yeah. And Monica, if you have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, Monica, healing the continent. Huh? What preventive uh, measures is put in place for Ghana in case of emergency? I don't know about that. Preventive measures in Ghana. I, I don't know about that. Um, See, that's gonna take that's gonna take research. Yes, by somebody. it will take research, but it's it's way too specific um, um. <clears throat> well there you I think you're gonna have to interview people in the community ask them that question and you know go go hands-on to people in your own communities to find out like like I love Kalaja says, you know, these are specific issues. And the only way to really find this out is by going to talk with people in your communities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, we might do innovative startups for each country in Africa. That could be a long series of um, one by one. But I don't know if that would be as. Um, general to get attention from everyone because this class is Africa. This is not Ghana. This is not Kenya only or Uganda only. So uh, I'm trying to cover something like commonalities in Africa and opportunities because in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, as Dr. Lambert was saying, there is huge opportunities for every single country in Africa. So that's why I kind of want to, you know, not want to go back into a single case, but I'm looking into uh, similar uh, opportunities all over the place. That's more interesting to everyone, I would say. No, El, El, if we were talking about that you were doing like first you the agriculture, the agricultural development, the, the lady who's working in Uganda who has her farm. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, then we said, okay, let's, let's do healthcare. Yeah. So we're gonna do a series of focus, like putting, putting certain areas of yeah. society under a microscope and saying, okay, let's look at agriculture, then healthcare. What would you wanna do next? Well, I think finance deserves next because finance has grown so much. Like the M-Pesa in Kenya is a leader in the world, in the finance world. It's a huge success story, but it's not the only one. That's the most uh, talked about one. Okay, but there's more. So I want to go into the finance because finance gets investment very quickly. And the amount of money that has been uh, drawn to finance is like seven or eight times or even more than what's going into healthcare. But finance is the infrastructure 
to healthcare. Finance is the infrastructure to education. So they all go hand in hand. So unless you have the means to, uh, to do the money circulation, uh, then the other sectors are going to be building upon it. Like construction is in like brick and mortar construction. That's another sector. Uh, but I would say education and finance are the big two that we need to touch upon in terms of opportunities because they're skyrocketing at this moment. Opportunities in finance and education are skyrocketing. So what would you say next class will be finance? Well, I guess I'm not really sure. I need to look into uh, real stories. That's where. That's why I can't say, yes, let's do it right away. I want true life stories and not pink rose gardens. These have drawbacks, challenges, tears, blood, sweat, but they're real and they're there. And you can check them out. I'm not making them up. I'm, you know, looking for real stuff. So Hopefully, I will get some finance uh, startup stories, innovation stories, and maybe they will uh, open up new areas of thought for your students as to where they can work or how they can open up their new businesses or how they can help partner maybe with these places or the new models of thinking. So, uh, yeah, we could do finance maybe. In one of your previous classes, did you talk about some microbanking? Mm, I I might have touched upon it, but I didn't yeah, I kinda, really. I kind of uh, remember it, something. I mean, yeah, for uh, agriculture, there's the microcredit thing. Uh, in India, this one guy was applying um, microcredit with women. I think some some something like that, but it could work. I mean, it's not uh, like brand new idea it's just very difficult to uh, apply but it works it works it's been done in i don't know pa pakistan or afghanistan some place like that i can't remember now but it definitely can be replicated so all right let's go to our next question from canbiro or kaido go ahead unmute your microphone Hello, everyone. Hello. Good to see you. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm uh, very interested uh, in this presentation. And uh, thank you, the nice uh, presenter, for your nice presentation. Um, I've just, uh, uh, this out of my discipline, but uh, I'm going to ask uh, some general question concerning the topic uh, you have presented here. The simple question I'm uh, going to ask is, uh, could you tell us the innovative health care practices in Africa? When, because when we say innovation means uh, there are an emerging issues or emerging technologies, emerging uh, products that will be created relation to the health, particularly in Africa. It's my question, thank you. Oh, there are many, many startups with many, many products uh, as far as diagnostics, treatments, stuff like that. But my main um, approach here is the uh, post disease uh, treatment idea of the West is being flipped and preventive healthcare is being introduced. So primary uh, healthcare knowledge is being disseminated to people and that is the innovation. <clears throat> but this is uh, possible because of the technological innovation, uh, business model innovation, marketing innovation. There's all sorts of innovations going on all at the same time. So I can't really name one, two, three because they're countless. But what I'm saying is uh, a tremendous 
change is taking place in Africa as far as healthcare provision system is concerned. And it's not happening only in Nigeria. It's happening all over the place through NGOs, through startups who are trying to scale up, get investment and grow. So <clears throat> I, I don't know how to answer your question any other way. <clears throat> Is this okay. that question? Okay. I think that's good. Okay. Thank you so much, Kambiro. Let's go to Chris Edmund. How are we doing on time? Um, I think I can have five more minutes. But five after more minutes. This, yeah. That that might be half a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Chris Edmund, yeah. Akute, go ahead. How are you? Hello. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, uh, Elif, how are you? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your presentation and everything was on point. But uh, I have a question for Dr. Lambert uh, concerning an email I received, uh, Go Green, and I saw a huge amount of money at the top. That's my school fees. I got asked, what is going on today? I think after um, after this presentation, after the live class, I'll stay here and I can answer questions like that that have to deal with. Oh, I thought uh, classes soon be over. That's why I'm. I know it could be, <laughs> but these topics are so uh, interesting. Let me go straight to the other question. Okay. Yeah, Mana Eli, uh, you know. We, the Africans, uh, there are many things that God has blessed us with in terms of uh, medicine or whatever. But how to I mean, re uh, process it to become a useful is one of the challenges that we have. And uh, sometimes uh, we abuse it, overdose, and uh, we don't know the quantity to use to cure or the quantity to use to affect our lives. Uh, that will have uh, some kind of effect in it. I remember people are getting some kind of illness, kidney failure and cold. Uh, I personally discovered that it's a way of abusing the medicine like herbal medicine and all those things. I know a doctor, not just a mere person, a doctor, a professional taking herbal medicine and uh, by the time they discover that uh, something is going wrong, his kidney got rotted and it died just like that. So some of things, uh, some, some things like this, how do we go about it? And how do we know, how can we know that this is the medicine that is a quantity we should use or how do we process it to become a useful, not just to waste a life? Because that is what is our fear now. People are dying out of ignorance, not that the medicine is not good, it's good, but it's like a way to use it become a problem. I, I tell you, one of my brother is good in herbal medicine and he's very good. He's in South Africa doing it well, curing all sorts of sickness. But other people that cook it, give it to people more than necessary that kills people in terms of kidney failure. That's what I want to know. What do we do about those things? I don't know. You can know something about it. I mean, this is beyond me. This is a very specific piece of thing. I, I just can't say much about that. I'm sorry. Really? Uh, all right. Maybe Dr. Lambert, you may have something to say about this. Maybe we should move on to the next question because I, I have little time left now. All right. I just wanted to, there's a comment here from Ola Supo, Ademoso. And he's saying that I, I didn't really comprehend the, the, really the depth of his comment. 
because he was saying that doctors are consulting the internet during consultations so that they this the correct application of knowledge so the practice of medicine is very dynamic and as such as a demonstration of wisdom by doctors who occasionally consult the internet to update themselves about the current practice in the field of medicine an example readily comes to mind is that a law student who is not current with the current position of the law would not shine in law examinations so he was basically saying that doctors can consult the internet because the internet is full of great information as far as healthcare, nutrition, psychology, medicines, ways of life. Is that what you got from the comment too, Elif Elijah? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And I agree. Uh, when doctors are consulting the internet for the most up-to-date information. And like you were saying, like you were saying, you were talking about the coverage of cell phones throughout Africa is great. So there's, everybody has access to the information. What matters is the triangulation, verification, because knowledge is out there, but which one is true? Which one is reliable? That is the question. I mean, there's all sorts of information out there. So you got to make sure that you are relying on a reliable knowledge or information. That's, uh, that would be the question in my case. Um, Nusubuka Herbert, maybe we could move on to Nusubuka. Hello, are you getting me? Mm -hmm. Hello. Yes. Yeah, this is Habat. This is Habat Subuga from Uganda. Uh, coordinator of uh, Operation International, based in the US, uh, which is um, a medical organization. Are you okay? Uh, first of all, I want to just uh, my appreciation for your wonderful presentation, and uh, it was not only touching but very educative. So Elif, I want to thank you so much for that. Secondly, um, I want to just to give, because of time, just a small um, uh, testimony about what you have uh, been sharing with us. I'm a coordinator of that organization, which is a life-saving organization, and I'm not a medical doctor, but I do it voluntarily. I was appointed by uh, the leaders of that organization voluntarily. But one thing which I want to appreciate and thank you for is that you have given the real message that um, you may not be a medical doctor, but you can just voluntarily involve yourself. And it is very interesting to see people's lives getting saved. So I want to just confirm what you have shared that it is so interesting to involve yourself in such a, a life saving uh, situation. So I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, by. Hello. Hi. Oh, did I? Hey, how are you? Thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing good. You guys are great. Um, I'm so happy with your 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 presentation today. But uh, my question just is like um. So you're talking about Africa, half in Africa. But uh, the thing here is that uh, some of the country in Africa, they don't have, um, oh, what can I say? They don't have the system. Like when you talk about medication, uh, some other medication are killing uh, people, like the organs, like the kerfuffle organs, let's say knees, uh, uh, lungs, and all those kind of things. Let me make it fast because there are some medication coming from outside Africa that is coming and damaging, the, it's over, over uh, like expired, let me say. So the, by the negligence of the government staff, I don't know, that is entering to the country and then people are consuming those drugs 
which is not proper for so it's not good to for people to consume that. I can give you an I can give you an example of a country like PRC. Some of people they they just consuming medication without even uh, taking any health care personal, but they just like some just consuming like consume like that. Some other pharmacy, other pharmacy that's operating behind the doors, you know, they are not credited so that they can be. So what can we do in those and uh, this kind of cases? Like people are taking drugs without knowing the dosage, without doing anything. You see, just consuming uh, uh, the drugs like that. So what can you say about it? I think that's not a problem of Africa. It's a problem everywhere. I mean, we have people taking drugs just like sugar pills in Turkey, and it's a personal issue. I mean, if you don't care about your personal health, and if you assume uh, pills are just like um, sugar, then of course you're going to have to suffer the consequences. I mean, you got to be wise when you're <clears throat> deciding what kind of drugs or pills or what to take in your body. So this is a personal matter, I would say. And if if people are not using their own discretion, what can the government do about this? This is a personal matter. So they need to be wise and they got to, you know, read on it and they need to see uh, drugs have side effects. I mean, the medication is a serious thing. It's not salt and pepper. So, I mean, that's my personal opinion, but I'm not an expert on it. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks so much. Um, Dr. Lambert, maybe we could make these last two questions the last. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Okay, so we only have two more questions. That's from Albert and Juliana. So let's go ahead, Albert, if you can go ahead and activate your microphone. Yes, Dr. Lambert, thank you very much. I'm Reverend Albert Chaydan. So uh, former lecturer at Garden City University College. I lectured uh, spiritual, spirituality in medicine. I wow. think, yes, I think the topic that our professor handled was well handled, making us, making us understand that uh, healing is preventive, curative, and also rehabilitative putting it in perspective how we can use the tools, the knowledge and the logistics in the context of the African culture to give a medical care. Uh, it was well handled and I praise her for that. The problem with Africa has to do with a good health care system, a good health care policy. And secondly, education, because education, uh, due to lack of fear and anxiousness can even kill a patient before he or she is given a health care. And all the government policies, I think innovatively, I will love to also appeal to the management that with respect to the topic we wanted to discuss in reference to Africa, I think the next topic will be good. It will be good to consider healthcare financial management in Africa. This is my humble op uh, opinion. I'm giving one topic healthcare financial management in Africa, be it internal or external, within or without, and how it can be sustained and managed within a good uh, number of time years to have a purposeful end or tell us. And secondly, if you are talking also about Africa, uh, Professor Lambert, I think it would also be good also look at medical care in African spirituality as a topic in context of the African culture. And in all that we were talking about, I also heard you uh, suggesting there could be a research work about Ghana. I am a Ghanaian living as a pastor in Italy and studying as well. I think AIU 
it's privileged to have one of the finest professors in Ghana, who is Dr. Gifty, a champion, a public health expert from AIU. And I think uh, talking about Africa alongside with professor, it would be good to also add an African lecturer so that some of the questions that are peculiar to the African situation, the doctor, the African uh, lecturer can also help as a teaching assistant to our lecturer. For this, uh, we are blessed as an AIU family to have one of the finest lecturers in one of the universities in Ghana, who is Dr. Giftia Champuma. I humbly appeal that maybe we could take it up and consider her to come in also. So that some of the particular questions which a professor in all the academic honesty could not touch it in times of that, the Ghanaian or African professor can also help. That's my humble submission. Thank you, Prof. Your presentation was excellent. God bless you. Thank you. <clears throat> and Juliana? Okay. Good day, everyone. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Lambert and uh, Elief, for the presentation. It has actually been very interactive and um, educative. Uh, my oh no hello how are you hearing me can you hear me no it we cut can off. hear you now you got cut off but can you hear me now yes okay thanks so much for the presentation it has been interactive and educative so uh, I really appreciate uh, Dr. Lambert for all those uh, webs and um, those important information and also Elio. Actually, I want to talk about the issue of um, the one, the question that was asked that how can dosages and um, uh, application of medical medications, how can, it, uh, how can we stop uh, all the problems caused as overdosage and the rest? Uh, I want to take Nigeria as a case example, like I'm in staff of National Agency for Food and Drugs Administration and Control, which is a regulatory body in NAVDAC, uh, in Nigeria by the government. It's an agency that looks into control and regulation of all regulated products, their transportation, their importation, and uh, even the pharmacovigilance, everything about the control of this regulated product, in including drugs, food, and so on. So what I want to bring out of this is that if each country in Africa can follow the example of having an agency like this that coordinates you no know, sort of regulates and controls these uh, use of medicine, both medical, about whatever it may be, whether it is um, the international medication, medications, whatever it is, so that they will, have, they will overcome the um, the overuse, that um, the misuse and abuse of these medications, so that it can help. To, uh, to prevent unnecessary uh, ailments like uh, kidney failure as a result of overdosage. Because by the time all these uh, professionals come together as medical doctor, pharmacist, food science, te food science technologists, uh, health and safety environment, all different disciplines are in NAVDAC. So it can help, like if they can implement something like this all over Africa, so as to control the use of medications to avoid all these unnecessary ailments and to ensure like is to safeguard the health of each nation in Africa so that everyone will be in sound health. So that okay, the you know, prevention, like you have said, prevention health care is more important. So as to prevent you no know, occurring of this uh, of these ailments by the time you are able to control and regulate this. Uh, regulated products. Thanks so much. That's a good point. Okay. Well, Dr. Lambert, I think we're done. Yep. Those were the last two questions. So again, LF Kalasia, this is amazing topic. 
just another piece of the puzzle. And so we look forward to having you back to put in more pieces of the puzzle, put this all together. So we look forward to whatever you're going to bring next time. We're thinking, I, uh, it's, thinking it's finance. It could be education. We'll leave it up to you. You know what? Each time I'm going diving into this research, it's mind blowing. What Africa is coming is it's what it's becoming is just blowing me, my mind. And I'm so thankful for you all giving me the opportunity to learn about Africa because it's like a major, um, tremendous revolution happening right in front of us. And Africa is writing history. In this, in this time, it's history being written. And 20 years from now, they will be talking about today, these days, and how it all got started. So I, I, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. Thank you so much. Well, See I think with time. that, you are free. Let me, let me give everybody the ability to unmute their microphones so that they can say bye to you because you're ready to go. But I'm going. I'm going to stay and, and help everybody with academic stuff. Hello, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your welcome. Bye. It was wonderful to meet you. We appreciate you. We appreciate you. We are going well. We are looking forward for more. We are looking forward for more. Thank you. Come back another time. Come back another time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 I hope to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Yes. Thank you. So much. God bless you once again.